and one was a Mets fan. They loved going down and watching the games and brought their kids and grandkids. And as they were approaching their 80s, they said, you know, we're not going to live forever. Let's make a pact before we die and go on to see our Lord Jesus Christ that whoever dies first has to ask God the Father permission he can come back through a dream or a vision or an angel and tell the other person alive whether there's baseball in heaven. And they said, well, that's good. That's important. I mean, I want to go to heaven, but I sure hope they have baseball in heaven. And so the Yankee fan and the Mets fan, they agreed, okay, whoever dies first can ask God special dispensation, see if they get, you know, you have not because you ask not, right? You got to ask. So sure enough, the Yankee fan guy, he went into his 90s and he passed, he died, went on to heaven for glory. He got up there and found St. Peter and, hey, how can I get back to see my friend? Go talk to the father, see if he gets permission. He gets permission. He says, you can go back. I don't normally do this, but I'll let you go back through a dream. So the Mets fan goes to bed and he's sleeping and the, the Yankee fan gets to come back from heaven and he comes to a dream and he says, hey, 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 I got good news. He says, that's wonderful. Is there a baseball in heaven? He says, hold on, hold on. I got good news and I got bad news. What do you want first? The Mets fan says, I want the good news. He says, there is baseball in heaven. Oh, that's great. What's the bad news? You're scheduled to pitch on Tuesday. <laughs> Glad you got it. <laughs> I'll tell jokes and people will laugh in the middle of my sermon when they get it, but that's all right. You can. <laughs> Amen. If you have a Bible with you, would you turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7? Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. Uh, October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and one of my parishioners just got me a new Bible. They noticed I was squinting when I was reading my Bible, so they, I went to a uh, Sam's Club and, and bought a Bible with large print, and when I brought it home, I saw it was made in China, and it wasn't large print. <laughs> and so he went and got me this new one, and it's got really large print, so I'm very grateful. <laughs> so I'm breaking it in today. But people are always trying to tap in in our nation to energy. Brand new energy. They're all excited here in the United States. We've just been, you know, I don't know if you know about water fracking, and they discovered all this natural gas. And uh, where I'm from in New York, they're putting up these windmills, and, and, and the wind is, and you got the wind energy, and now people are going crazy. They're trying to get all this power and energy. They're putting solar stuff. They got solars on, solar things on their, on their roofs. And people are excited about that. Of course, the United States has done very well with nuclear energy and the power that comes from nuclear energy. Now they're trying to tap into the waves and low tides and high tides, just trying to get energy and power. But the greatest untapped energy still left in this world that only Christians know about is the power of prayer. And I want to talk about that. And uh, I want to talk about what Jesus said, and I've entitled my message today, Why We Pray Continually, because I'm sure there are many of you out there that you've prayed some prayers, and maybe you haven't got an answer in days, weeks, months, years, or maybe like Abraham, 25 years for Isaac. And do you know Isaac prayed for 20 years to have Jacob and Esau? And so what happens to these prayers that we pray in? You know, we've been praying and praying and praying. It's like, God, you know, what's up? Are you going to answer this? Or is it, is it a no? And we don't always understand. Sometimes we know God's speaking to us, but how many know we don't always know what he's saying? And he just kind of draws us in a little bit more. And so Jesus gives us a great teaching here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. And I want to go through it today. And let's read through Matthew 7. And I'm going to read verses 7 to 11. And so Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. For everyone who asks receives, and to him who seeks he finds, and to him who knocks, the door is open. Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, will you give him a stone? Or if his son asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? 
And then the big contrast. This is not a comparison to God. This is a contrast. If you and me, being evil, contrasted to God, know how to give good gifts to our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, how much more will our Father in heaven give good things to those who ask? And so bow your heads with me, and we'll just open up in a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear what your Spirit would say today. I thank you, Lord God, for the worship that has prepared the hearts for the seed of the word that is about to be dropped into our hearts. Lord, let it find noble hearts, good ground, good soil, that it would lodge and bring forth fruit for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you about different types of prayers today because not all prayer is the same. And it is un wise of us to think that every different type of prayer is the same. The Bible talks about intercession, supplication, prayer, and um, just different types of things. And so Jesus gives us different levels of prayer, and there are certain prayers that we pray that if we don't connect to that level, we will never get an answer from our Father. Not because it's not God's will. It's because we haven't followed the certain procedure that God wants laid out. And so let's, first of all, number one, talk about the requests of prayer. Jesus tells us there's three basic requests of prayer. And the first one is what we call the desire that asks. Ask. What's the verse say? Ask, and it will be given to you, Matthew 7, 7. So the biggest, pro oh, I forgot. I apologize. Thank you, Vinny. I forgot to remind you. I have an outline that uh, Vinny, as a servant, is handing out. So if you've got a pen, he'll, uh, if you'd like one, just put your hand up and Vinny will give it to you. So I apologize, Vinny. I forgot to mention that. Do you know the greatest problem with prayer today is not unanswered prayer? It's unoffered prayer. And Jesus said that you need to ask. In James chapter 4, verse 2, he says, you do not have... Because you do not what? Yeah, sometimes we get mad at God and God says, I'm waiting for you to ask. John Wesley, I mean, heard of John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement. He made a very radical statement. Some people think it's heretical. I agree with it. And he said this about prayer. God has limited himself on this earth to the prayers of the saints and does nothing without the saints praying. Isn't that radical? I mean, if that's true, God does nothing except we first pray. And so it tells you how important prayer is. God, doesn't he tell us to pray that the Son of Man comes? Pray for the second coming. Pray for the government leaders. Pray for the president. Uh, pray for peace of Israel. And so we need to pray. Luke 18, 1, Jesus says, and this is a quote, that men ought to always pray. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. See, different types of prayer. Everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and then the promise, and the peace of God, that passeth all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. And so, prayer. Prayer ought to be as normal to us as breathing, right? And yet sometimes, we sometimes make a mistake as a Christian thinking that, well, I have my spiritual life, and then I have my secular life. I pray in the church, but I don't pray when I go golfing. Well, maybe you should. Do you know, as a follower of Jesus Christ, there is no difference between your spiritual and secular life. It's all the same. It's all the same. Now, being from Canada, I play hockey. I enjoy sports. I'm not a sports fanatic, but I enjoy sports. And you know, teams, uh, there's a lot of people that pray for the Yankees. Didn't get answered this year, did it? <laughs> pray for the Mets. Obviously, someone here has got faith. You know, the, whether it's the Buffalo Bills or New England Patriots and 
But uh, you say, well, is that silly to pray about it? No, I don't think so. I have people come to me and say, Pastor, how do I know if I should do this or not? Is it okay for me to go to this movie? Should I go here or there? And I usually say, if you can pray about it, you can do it. What if I can't pray about it? Then you shouldn't do it. <laughs> what did you say, honey? Okay, A is the request of prayer. A is the request of prayer. Everyone get one? And I'm on number one, the desire that asks. And I'm about to go to the third verse, John 16, 24. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, there's many reasons why I pray. And one of the reasons why I like to pray is that it fills my joy tank. Sometimes life gets hard, life beats you down. There's a difference between happiness and joy. You know that, right? Happiness comes from happenings. When the happenings in your life are going good, you have happiness. When happiness, happenings are not going good, you lose your happiness. But joy is a different story. Joy is an inside job. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit. So you can have bad happenings going on and not be happy but still have a joy. And one of the ways you can fill your joy tank is when you pray and you get answers to prayer. It makes you happy. And so the next verse in John 16, 24, Jesus says, Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be what? So if you're struggling a little bit with joy today, I would say, how's your prayer life? How's your prayer? Maybe we need to pray, right? And ask God to do that. So don't, don't divide in your life spiritual from secular. You know, I play hockey still. And uh, I, play, I, I play Thursday nights. And when I go play hockey, it's one of the few times I get to rub shoulders with people who don't know Jesus Christ. And sometimes I'm the only Christian. And a lot of them know I'm a minister. You know, they call me Rev, the Rev. How are you doing, Rev? And every time I go to hockey, I'll say, Lord, I ask for two things. I ask that you would use me somehow tonight, Lord. Use me. I pray that you would use my words. Help me to minister to someone. And number two, Lord, I'd like to get a goal or an assist. Because I, I like getting a goal or assist. You play baseball, you like to get a hit. You like to get on base. And golfing, you like a good, you know, a good golf score. And so this past Thursday, you know, God was very gracious. I got a couple goals, a couple assists. And we played hockey from 10 to 11.30, and I'm tired, I'm ready to go home. And this Jewish guy says, hey, Rev, can I talk to you? He's a Jew. He says, I'm really concerned about our world, and I just wanted to get your two cents on it. I said, well, I would be happy. How many know that when God wants to use you, he doesn't use you at convenient times? There's a little saying, uh, divine opportunity knocks at inopportune times. Always cost you something. So I said, okay, what do you want to talk about? Well, I'm concerned about our president and Israel and this and that. And how many know you can't talk to a Jewish person about the New Testament? So you go back to the Old Testament. You remember the story of Daniel when the rock came and hit the statue. The statue represents all the governments of the world. And the rock is Jesus Christ. And the fact that the statue falls means man has to learn that man cannot govern itself. That includes the United States of America. And it'll all fall so that when Jesus comes back, we'll say, finally, someone who can govern this world. And so I shared that with him. And he says, I never thought about that. Never thought about it. So I, it makes me happy that God answered my prayer. You know, us preachers, we have to work hard to get around people who don't know Christ. We really do. And so it's what I call the asking for. Our responsibility is the asking. God's responsibility is giving answers, but he doesn't give answers unless we first ask. So that's number one. First level prayer, desire that asks. Number two, this is a higher level, the discernment that seeks, all right? The discernment that seeks. This is not the same as a simple prayer. Matthew 7, 7, it says, Ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find. So this is a little different. This is when you're on a quest. 
Maybe you've lost something. Do you remember Jesus talked about the parable of the woman who lost the coin and she went and tried to find the coin? This is a different level of prayer. You are on a journey and you don't know where you're going. And the Bible says that we always, in all our ways, acknowledge him and he will direct our what? Our paths. And so that's what we do. We're trying to find something. There's something I know. Maybe you're praying about, should I marry this person or should I not? Well, how many know not any spouse will do? <laughs> should I buy this car or should I not? Should I go to this college or should I go to that college? This is a discernment that seeks. You need the mind of Christ. And if you don't seek the mind of Christ, you could marry the wrong person. You could go to the wrong school. You could buy the wrong car. And so James tells us in James 4, 3, he says, listen, when you pray, you also need to ask God with your heart and your motives be right. Because sometimes your motives can be wrong. And so it says in James, it says, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. And so God's not going to give you another man's wife. God's not going to give you another person's car. God's not going to give you someone else's job. It's just not going to happen. And so you need to ask God, and it takes time. And this is not a one prayer will do you. This is when you just keep praying and keep praying and keep praying until God gives you some revelation. We're Pentecostal. We believe that God still speaks today. You know, there's a lot of Christians that don't think God speaks anymore. They say, if you can't get it from here, that's it. Good luck, buddy. But we believe in the Spirit of God that speaks. He speaks in dreams and visions. Old men will dream dreams. Young men will see visions. And your handmaidens and children will prophesy. We still believe God speaks. It's not always easy to understand what he's saying. But that's okay. We know he's speaking. And so I'll give you an example of this discernment that seeks. Quite a few years ago when our, when our boys were at home, we'd go up to Niagara Falls. And in the non-tourist season, we'd get a cheap hotel with a nice pool and hot tub and, and you know, it'd be very nice in the winter. So we went up there one time and we were in the pool and we got changed and I lost my wedding ring. And I couldn't find my wedding ring. And my wife says, if you want to go back in the United States, you better get your wedding ring. <laughs> no, she didn't. But <laughs> she says, you better find your wedding ring. And so I thought, well, I don't know. When I go on vacation, my mind kind of just goes kaput. And uh, so I'm like, Lord, what did I do with it? I don't know. And so I began to pray. And how many know that uh, the Bible says in James 5, 16, that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man veils much. Even when your wife is leaning on you, you better find it. <laughs> so I started to pray. I said, Lord, help me. Help me to I don't know what I did. I don't know if it's in the pool. I don't know where it is. So I prayed. And you know what God said to me? Nothing. That ever happened to you? Pray? It says nothing. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a simple desire. So I pray a little harder. You pray a little harder. God, I really need to find this. And, and then we went out to lunch. My wife said, did you find it yet? No, I didn't find it yet. And then come home, Lord, please, I, I don't know where it is. I need your help. You know where it is. Help me. And so after a while, I saw jeans. I just saw jeans come into my into the eyes of my spirit, I saw jeans. And I said, hey, it's in my jeans. So I check my jeans, and they're not there. And I run to my suitcase, and I have another pair of jeans. I pull in there, can't find it. So I rip my suitcase apart. I can't find it. And I'm like, Lord, I thought you said jeans. Yeah, I don't know. So Cindy's like, come on, it's time to go out. You know, we're going to go to the pool, then we're going to go eat and so uh, dinner. And so we went out to the pool. And um, then we went to eat, and I come home, and I was like, Lord, I'm still praying. How many of you know you just still keep praying and praying? So it's time to go to bed, and we put on our pajamas, and my wife throws her jeans on the bed, and what do you think came out of her jean pocket? <laughs> my wedding band was in her jean pocket the whole time. Uh, I thought God was telling me they were in my jeans. God says, I didn't say that. I just showed you jeans. And it's interesting. God will say something, and we think he's saying this, but he's not. He's saying this, and it, it's just sometimes a little bit confusing. So that is, a, that is the discernment that seeks. You don't stop praying until you find what you need, what's lost, the quest, what direction, you know, what job you want. Maybe you got two job offers. What do I take, God? 
I mean, no, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. That don't work for Christians. You want what God wants. And so that's the second level. And then the third level, and probably the most intense level of prayer, is a determination that knocks. Determination that knocks. There is a desire to ask, there's a discernment to seek, and there's a determination that you have to have a bulldog faith. Anyone have any bulldogs? You know something about a bulldog, when that bulldog bites, it doesn't let go. And sometimes you have to have a bulldog faith when you're praying, saying, God, I'm not going to stop praying until I get an answer. And if you don't have that, there are certain answers to prayer you will not get. And it's not because God's trying to be mean. It's that God is trying to let you know that there are certain measures of faith you have to get in order to get certain answers to prayer. And so this is a determination. Matthew 7, 7, ask, it'll be given to you, level one. Seek, and you will find, a little bit harder. Knock, and the door will be open. Now, what do we normally knock on? Doors. And what type of doors do you usually knock on? Closed doors. We don't normally knock on open doors, right? Closed doors. And so Jesus is telling us something here. You're going to experience as a follower of Jesus Christ closed doors that are not going to open until you knock appropriately. All right? And that knocking may be because the devil is on the other side or because life is on the other side or because God is on the other side saying, I'm growing your faith. You need more faith. And I have this for you, but not until you have a hundred measures of faith. You say, what's a hundred measures of faith? I don't know. Maybe it's praying 50 times and fasting three days. Praying 50 times equals 50 measures of faith. And fasting three days equals 50 measures of faith. You say, I don't want to fast. I like food. What Christian doesn't? We all like food. But sometimes God says, you need to fast for this. You have to fast. And if you fast, I will give it to you. It's not that the devil's behind the door. It's that God is trying to bring you into deeper things. And he wants to bless you. Let me show you another passage in Luke 11. If you, if you want to quickly turn over to Luke's Gospel 11. And I'll read you Luke 11, 5. This is not in your outline. But this gives us a little bit of an understanding. Because it says, knock, and it will be open unto you. In the Greek, it's in the present tense, which means you keep on knocking. You keep on knocking. You keep on knocking. It doesn't mean you knock once, and it will be open. You keep asking, and then God will open the door. It's a persistence. So here's a parable in Matthew 11, verse 5. And it says, let's see here. Well, I'm in Mark. That's why. Luke eleven five. 5. Jesus says a parable. And he said to him, Which of you shall have a friend to go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on this journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, within the house, within the door, bedtime do not trouble me the door is now what and my children are with me in bed i cannot rise and give it to you i say to you though he will not rise and give it to him because he is his friend yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs so let me give you this couple things here number one in the middle eastern culture when you had a friend show up to your house it was an insult not to have food to set before them. Very offensive, all right? Here in the United States, you don't have food? Hey, let's go down, you know, we'll go down to Applebee's or something, all right? But there, it's very offensive. So he had unexpected guests show up, doesn't have no, so he goes over to his friend's house, and his friends, they're already to go to bed, and back in those days, they didn't have four-bedroom houses. They had two rooms, maybe one room, and they all slept in the same room, and they all slept with the dogs and the animals would sleep sometimes in the same house, and the, and the locks were complicated. All right? Complicated locks. 
So you got a neighbor knock and say, give me three loaves. He says, no, go away, go away. The, babe, the dog, you're going to wake, go away. But he will not give him the bread because of he's his friends, but because of his persistence. He says, you're going to wake the baby, you're going to wake the dog. The neighbor's dog going to start barking. you got to stop. I'm not going to stop until you give me what you want. And Jesus is trying to give us a picture. This is how our Father in heaven is. God means business with those who mean business with him. And he will give you what you want. And so that's what we need to get. We need to get that attitude of prayer. And even Jesus Christ himself, do you know? He prayed three times one time, three times in the Garden of Gethsemane, trying to get an answer, a different answer. In fact, let me read it to you. Matthew 26, 44, it says, And he, Jesus, left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. If Jesus prays three times, how many of you know maybe we need to pray more than three times in our knocking? There's something that you've been praying about for years, and you've given up praying. And God says, my delays are not my denials. You have to come up to a higher level. And I want to build in you some faith, because there are greater things I want to see accomplished through you for my glory but you don't have the faith yet. And, well, how do you grow in faith? Well, let me tell you something that many American Christians forget. Opposition is the food of faith. Faith only grows where it's resisted. And if you don't like resistance, you don't like the faith of God. And so that's why we keep knocking. Well, let's get on to the, the second part, the rewards of prayer. We talked about different requests. Ask, seek, knock. Different levels. Requires more intensity. May require fasting and prayer. If you really want that person saved, if you really want that person healed, if you really want to see that breakthrough in business or whatever it is, it will require something of you. But then the second thing is not only the requests, but it's the rewards. I don't know about you, but I not only pray that my joy tank will be filled, but I pray because I like answers. I like to get rewards. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a what? A rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So let's get into this. I used to think there were three answers to prayer. Yes, no, and what's the third? Maybe. <laughs> but I believe there are four answers to prayer now, and I want to give them to you. For everyone who asks receives, to he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door is open. So the first answers of prayer is when God's answers are direct. It's a yes, all right? So maybe you got some young people that are studying in high school, studying in college. Lord, I've really worked hard for this test. Help me to ace it. And they ace the test. Thank you, Lord. Maybe you had a little girl, and she's going to Sadie's Hawkins dance, and She's asking a boy. Remember the Sadie Hawkins dance? You'd ask the boy. And mom says, you got a budget. Go get a dress. This is the budget. And it's like, oh, Lord, help me to find a dress on sale. And she goes to Kohl's, and it's on sale. And she's got $25 Kohl's cash. It's like, wow, thank you, Jesus. I got it. It's a, it that's, it's a direct answer. All right? You ask for something. You get it. It's like, thank you. But not all answers come that easy, do they? It is nice when they come that way. Then there are different ones, which I say when God answers are different. You ask him for one thing, he doesn't give it to you, he gives something different, but the different thing is better. So you go and ask your employer for a raise, and he gives you a promotion. You're not going to argue with God, are you? It's not what I asked for. It's different. But it's better. You say, Lord, I just moved and I need a friend. And you start making friends and that friend turns into a fiancé. You didn't ask for that. You just wanted a friend, but you got a fiancé. Different. Better. Right? Better. Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. And so sometimes he will give us uh, something different, but better. All right? My wife and I, we, uh, we own a home, and a few years ago we went and we, we remortgaged. And we were praying, Lord, we would like to get four and a quarter percent, maybe four percent, and that would be great from our current mortgage rate, 
And we locked in at three and three quarters. It's not what I asked for. Different. Better. Isn't that nice of our God? He's so good. He, he can do something better than us. And so sometimes the answers are direct. Yes. Sometimes they're different. No, I, you're thinking too low. I have something better for you. Sometimes they are denied. We don't like this. But if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, God loves you so much, there are things he knows about you that you don't know, and you're going to have to trust when he says no. All right? He will say no to certain jobs that we think is perfect for us, and God says, no, you don't know what I know. The little teenage boy that gets his license and starts praying, Lord God, give me a Maserati. And God sees six months down the road the Maserati wrapped around a telephone pole with him in it. God says, no, follow me. When God says no, it's usually frustrating. But if we believe he is good, we'll understand that his no's are because he loves us. All right, he will say no. It says, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father give good things to those who ask? If he says no, what you're asking for is not good. You may think it is, but there comes that trust test. We've got to trust God, amen? And then lastly, let's talk about God's answers when they're delayed. This is the most frustrating one, isn't it? We pray for years and maybe even a decade, and you have to understand something with God. His delays are not his denials. There has to be a certain measure of faith. And when you reach that measure of faith, it's not God toying a carrot in front of you. That's not what he's doing. He's trying to grow. He says, what you have to ask me is very good, but you are not ready for it. If I give it to you now, it could destroy you. If I give it to you when you're ready, it will prosper you. I do not want to give something to you that will destroy you. So maybe the timing is wrong because our character is not ready for it, right? Especially we're praying for a spouse. Maybe we're ready for the spouse. Maybe God's not done working on the spouse. How many of you don't want to get a spouse premature of the work of God in their life? And so God says, wait, wait. His delays are not his denials. God is not only good, but he's wise. And he knows whether it's character or whether he has to grow your faith. Uh, timing is everything. Galatians 4.4 4 says, But in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son to be born of a woman, to be born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might become the sons of God. God said during the Roman Empire was the perfect time for Jesus Christ to be born. Not a month earlier, not a month later. And there are some of you, you've given up on some prayers. You said, ah, oh, I guess I'm tired of it. And God has sent me here from New York to tell you his delays are not his denials. And he's asking you to stir it up again and start praying for that. All right? Not all answers are simple yes. It's not as easy as going down to coals. <laughs> you have to pray a little more. You have to be a little more intense. Sometimes you may have to fast a meal, fast a day, maybe fast two days. And you say, how much, you know, is it that much important to you? And so the last thing I'd like to share with you is some of the things over the last 10 years at our church that we've seen God do in our church through of people that, like you, they are praying people, they love God, they believe in God's goodness. And I want to just share some requests that were answered from our church, some simple ones. I remember we had a guy that right before the company closed down, there was a company in France that was in Rochester, and he retired a day before they shut down the whole company. And he was so grateful. He went back to school to become substance abuse counselor, and when he finished his bachelor's at 44, he says, Pastor, I'm running out of money. <laughs> I need a job about within a month that I graduate. Would you pray with me that I could get a job? And I said, yes, we will pray. It was a, a, a request. 
and he got a month, within a month, he got, a, he got the job. He was just so amazed how good. And so that was just, you know, simple, a desire that asks, a desire that asks. Uh, there was a couple young people in our, in our church that were getting their first homes. There's nothing like getting your first home. And we try to tell our kids, don't get your dream home, your first home. Get something you can afford. And so these two of these young couples, they went and got these homes, and, and they were frustrated because it didn't close on the first date. You know, closings don't always go the way you wish they would. And they said, Pastor, pray. There's, there's, there's resistance behind this. Would you pray with us? And I said, yes, I will pray. I'll pray that every I will be dotted, every T will be crossed, and we will pray. And they went through a, a second closing. And then on the third closing, it worked out, and they got excited. So that wasn't a simple asking. That was a seeking. Lord, we got the right house. Is everything working out here? You know, then we had two teachers in our church that were married to each other, and we had school cutbacks. I'm sure you guys have that here. And they were the low people on the totem pole, school cutbacks. And I said, Pastor, pray that we don't get cut. We're supposed to get cut. Pray that we don't. We, and I said, I will pray with you. All right, let's pray together. And they didn't get cut. And boy, was there an uproar at that school. <laughs> they should have been cut. Why didn't they get cut? Well, I guess it's not what you know, it's who you know. That's right. <laughs> and so that was an amazing answer to prayer where the low men didn't get cut. And uh, then there was, uh, there was one woman. Um, she, for nine years, she tried to get pregnant. Her name's Sarah. For nine years. And we would lay hands on her womb. We'd call forth the baby in faith. We would fast and pray for nine years. And sometimes God will give you a vision and then the death of the vision before the fulfillment of the vision. And she's just about to give up, and what do you know? She got pregnant. And nine years she waited. Talk about your faith being tested for nine years. And then we had another... Uh, a lovely woman, uh, just a beautiful, spirited woman. She, you know, they come to me, see, and I, I don't know what it is, but when we pray for people, a lot of them get pregnant pretty quick. I, I don't know what it is. So I said, it must be the water or something. I don't know, but we got a water fountain in the back. Take a drink of the water in faith. But anyways, she came and we prayed for her, and she got pregnant, and she had a miscarriage. And it was so sad. And she come back, and we prayed for her again. She had a second miscarriage. And she come back again, and she had a third miscarriage. I'm like, Lord, please help us. And, and she is the sweetest woman you've ever met. And you could, you could just see she's just so crushed. And God gave me a dream. He gave me a prophetic dream of me and her and her sister. And there were twins. Twins were born in this dream. And all I knew is that it wasn't me who were having twins. It was one of them. So couldn't figure out whose twins they were. So I thought, well, someone's going to have twins. But when God speaks, you don't always know exactly what he's saying. And so if you speak too quick, I say, you're going to have twins, and then she has twins, and then I look like an idiot. <laughs> so I said, I had a dream that you or your sister were going to have twins. Well, the one that had three miscarriages was pregnant six months later, and she had twin boys. And she gave birth to them, and she named her first one Isaac. <laughs> And her second one, Joshua. And just the testimony of not giving up. Even sometimes you fast and it doesn't come in the time that you want it to come. You know, and then, of course, we, we see a lot of people, jobs with our economy since 2008. The economy has really been hit hard and people lose jobs and we see people get jobs. And so this one woman came to me. She says, I'd like to get a job. And Five years, we prayed for her to get a teaching job. And uh, within five years, she finally got a teaching job in a school district. She's just subbing the whole time, teacher's aide, teacher's assistant. And then we had another woman in our church. She was a sub for like nine years. She says, Pastor, even my husband doesn't believe that God's going to answer this prayer. I've been praying for nine years. Would you please stand with me and pray? And I said, yes, Holly. That was her name, Holly. I said, yes, Holly, I will stand. And wouldn't you know, a month later, she got the job. She had bulldog faith. She wouldn't let go. And I don't know who said it, but getting an answer to prayer with God, it's not overcoming God's reluctance to answer his prayer, but it's laying hold of his willingness. 
Well, how do I get God's willingness? I don't know. That's a discernment that seeks the mind of Christ. It may be praying for five years. It may be fasting. It may be adding fasting to your lifestyle, fasting a meal a week, two meals a week, three meals a week. I don't know. But what I do know is that Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I, the Lord, know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. And if what you're praying about is good, don't stop. You keep praying. You've laid, you know, I just kind of sense in my spirit that some of you have prayed things and you say, forget it, must not be God's will, just lay it down. And I believe God is saying, no, 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 no. My delays are not my denials. It's time you start stirring up the faith. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's not your faith, it's his faith. And so bow your heads with me, would you, as we close in prayer. And uh, I'm going to ask a uh, uh, pastor if he would come down to the altar. And I'm going to ask uh, Roger, too. And I'm going to ask the youth pastor if you would come and join me for a bit with the musicians. And uh, would you just bow your heads for a second? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are a good God. We sang about how we're in awe of you because of the cross and what you have did with the blood of washing away our sins. But sometimes, Lord, we get stuck in life, not knowing the next step, not knowing the next chapter. But you said in Proverbs, Lord, if we would acknowledge you in all our ways, that you would direct our path. And I'm praying for people today, Lord, that are discouraged because they've prayed for years, years about things, and they're not getting any further and I pray, Lord God, that you would stir up in them a spirit of faith. I pray, Lord, as Samson of old would stir himself up, that you would stir them up. Lord, that they would not accept defeat, but they would keep knocking. Start seeking again and see you press through. And Lord, we're just asking, Lord, and Father, as we come around to the altar soon, Lord, we pray, Father, that you would reignite faith. You said, if two would agree as to touching anything, Lord, that we would have it. And Lord, I pray, Father, that you this day would glorify your name and that through the prayers that we're going to ask, Lord, around the altar, Lord, that you would send angels into the future to begin to set things right to answer these prayers for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, I would like to ask you to stand for a second with me. I don't know what time you finish here, but um, I feel there's some, some here today that I would really encourage you to come down to the altar. There's something that you've been praying about and you've given up on. And as I was preaching this, I believe God has brought it back into your spirit. And say, well, gee, maybe, maybe God didn't shut the door. Maybe it's still open. And we would like to pray with you down to the altar. And uh, if that is you, I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith and come on down. And again, I'm going to ask, you know, uh, Pastor Roger and our youth pastor to come down as well. And uh, we want to pray for you. I'm going to come down here. We're just going to take some time as the musicians worship. We would like to stir up the gift of faith and see whatever that is. I don't know what it is. Only you and God know what it is. But if you would lay hold of that today and say, hey, would you pray with me? I've been praying for years, and I don't think God is finished. Help me stir this up, and I believe God would do that. Amen. And then why don't you come? We'll pray for you as they come, and as our musicians lead us in a song, we'd love to lay hands on you and pray with you if you would come.
Your name. 